What about the dump? Hi, folks. Um, <laughs> it's Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa, and uh, we're looking at the night sky. Uh, we're going to concentrate on some really brilliant objects, i.e. Orion and so on, that's in our sky at the moment, uh, that you can go out and have a look at. Anyway, uh, not sure where we are at the moment. <laughs> Okay, folks, sorry about that little tiny uh, technical hitch here. Anyway, we're all back going uh, together at the moment. Always like to thank uh, Dan Browson, who is our uh, supporter of this pro and sponsor of this program. And also on the program today, uh, we've got Kay, uh, Kay Leather joining us as well to talk about a few things. But the main thing I wanted to really get a look at is look at what's in our sky right now, the last of the summer stars. Of course, you might say, what's he got a picture of the sun up there for? Well, our sun, of course, is the nearest star. And it's one star that it's lovely to see, particularly after all the wild weather we've been having lately. All right? uh, and it is a star. And when we, when we look up in there in the sky, or even, and even looking at the sun, we've got no concept of um, distances or size and so on, because we've got nothing in our brain that can relate to what, how big an object is and so on. So let's have a look at our own particular star, which we call the sun. All right? Well, the sun itself is a, a gig like all other stars, is a gigantic uh, fusion reactor. It temperatures are so hot, it surface temperatures around about you know 5,000 degrees Celsius, rising up to about 15 million degrees near the center. Temperatures so high that no 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 solids or liquids can still exist, but Due to its enormous mass, the density of the material in the interior of the sun is greater than any solid or thing that we find here on, on Earth. Right? And at the centre is a gigantic fusion reactor. Right? And this is what, essentially, when you look at a hydrogen bomb, always remember when they first detonated a hydrogen bomb, yes, I'm that old, um, I remember them saying, oh, we've released the energy of the sun because that's actually what powers the sun is thermonuclear reactions. All right? And it, um, the sun is annihilating matter at the rate of 4 million tonnes a second, which it turns into energy and that illuminates this, this uh, star of ours. OK, well, put things into perspective, for those of you watching this on uh, TV, I've now got a little view of the sun and its planets to scale. When I say scale, not not talking about distances between the planets or anything like that, in physical size. And you get a good idea. You can see the Earth there. Well, you could fit over a million Earths inside the sun. And this is the difference between a star and a planet. All right? And the planets are essentially just a debris left up behind from the formation of our, of our sun. All right? So that's how it actually works. OK, so... If we were to travel out into space, well, if we were to go out about, um, I don't know, shall we say about four light years or something like that. Um, remember, light is a distance light, light travels in a year. So we'll go out a few light years. If we went out beyond, the, so shall we say, uh, 30 light years, you'd have great difficulty actually even spotting our sun. It would be so faint. And in fact, much beyond that, you'd need a telescope to see the sun. Forget about looking at the planets. We're talking about just seeing the sun, all right, around this sort of thing. And when we look up into our night sky, and for those of you who are looking out there, you can see over our, our, our summer night sky in the early evening looking north. And we've got all these different stars there. But looking at them, we don't know. Some are brighter than others, obviously. But we don't know whether that difference in brightness is due to the fact that the star is actually intrinsically brighter or it's closer to us, right? Because until we measure them, their distances, we can't tell anything like that at all. So I always like to liken it to um, when you stand out, like this is looking from my at home, from my uh, uh, little cottage there, looking out over Stonehenge towards the mountains beyond. And as you look out across the paddock there, you can see, you can see uh, our bull called Taurus, right? And beyond that, you can also see some sheep and so on. 
So those are the big things you can see. But what the eye doesn't pick up is the literally hundreds of birds that are out there. And there are tens of thousands, possibly millions of insects and smaller creatures like mice and so on. So our eyes pick that up and exactly the same thing applies when we look out at the sky, at the sky at night. Our eyes are seeing just the big brighter objects, but they're not seeing the common or garden variety. The vast majority of stars at any great distance are not visible to the unaided eye. So most of the stars that we can see in the night sky are giants much bigger and brighter than our sun. Now, this is not to put our sun down. Our sun is above average brightness as, as most stars go. But these things are really like the, the bull in the paddock, right? Uh, amongst all the millions of other smaller creatures out there. And I thought what we do today is we concentrate on the most famous constellation in the sky, which, of course, is the constellation of Orion, um, which is in our summer evening sky. Just after it gets dark, you'll see it out there looking north. And Orion is a good example of where we've got some really big, bright stars. So we're going to have a look at Orion in a little bit of closer detail. Well, for those who got watching this on TV, you can see Orion. Don't worry about the fact it's upside down because we are, of course, as far as the Northern Hemisphere is concerned, America and Britain and so on, we are all upside down here. Um, but if you were to go to the Northern Hemisphere, of course, he would be round the other way. All right? So, But anyway, it says there's Orion. There's a couple of the important things about Orion. First of all, because he's made up of big, bright stars, but he's a marker for the seasons. Now, down here in New Zealand, Australia, it's essentially the marker of summer. Richard, a lot of people don't realise what Orion is, but they do know the pot. Yes, I know. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've got the pot coming up soon. Okay. So, so we should be able to pick it because people got, make up different patterns out of the stars. But he marks summer. Where I come from originally, which is England, it marked a winter. And while this constellation is in the sky, that was nippy and cold. And same here. It's the opposite way around. It's summer. And as, 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 the, as we proceed towards autumn, we'll find that Orion is setting earlier and earlier. And by the time we get into winter, you won't be able to see it at all. Right? The other important thing about Orion, not only just being a seasonal marker, right, it also, the celestial equator runs through what we call the belt of Orion. We'll look at this in closer detail. Now, the celestial equator is the equator of the Earth projected out into space. And for, for those of you watching this on TV, all the stars are below uh, the celestial equator, as seen from here in the Wairapa, uh, well, they're all in the, they're what we call the northern stars, and those above the celestial equator are the southern stars. And of course, that's what he would look like uh, for those of you watching it. This is there's Orion, as you can see, uh, as you would see him in the northern hemisphere. Not that you can see Orion like that, but you can certainly see the stars. Okay. So let's have, go and have a closer look. Now, what Kay just mentioned, down here, doesn't look in any way as spectacular as Orion, but uh, this is the pot in the sky. Right? And I guess it was named by the, because it does look a bit like a pot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess if you get closer to it. Okay. Well, what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll go in and have a closer look. And this to do this, we're going to use a bit of photography, all right? Uh, starting off with just basic photographs of the sky, leading up ultimately to images taken by the biggest telescopes, including the space telescopes and so on. So here we see the Orion straight up. Now, for you looking at this on TV, one of the things you'll notice is that you can see that the stars are different colours. Most of the big bright stars there, you can see are sort of bluey white colour. But down the bottom, there's a pinky coloured star. And the reality is that stars are all vary in temperature. Right? Our sun is a yellow star. No, that is the that to say is that its peak of its radiation that it's going out is in the way, in visual wavelength the yellow. Stars hotter than our sun, if you heat them up, uh, become white and then blue white, right, and violet and so on. So that tells us these bluey white stars are hotter than the sun. Cooler stars, which are the majority of stars in the universe, all right, uh, 
a, 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 a cooler colour. So if you were to cool the sun down, first of all it would turn to deep yellow, then to orange, then finally to red. And of course that star that you can see down at the bottom right there, which is a big brilliant star, uh, well that's an orangey red coloured star. So those are the colours that we can see in there. But again, looking at this group of stars, we've got no idea of what their distances are and so on. So there, there's Orion just to pick it out what, what those stars are there. Right, now, looking at uh, Orion itself, you've got the belt stars, which is the bottom of the pot, and then the handle of the pot is actually the sword of Orion. And so we're going to go in and have a bit of a closer look at those in a moment. But first of all, we'll have a look at uh, Betelgeuse down there. That's that orangey-red star down there. And this is going to give you an idea, because for those of you watching this, it's actually put its distance up 427 light years. Now, I want to put this into perspective. That is a, this is a, over 100 times further away than the nearest st other star to us beyond the solar system. All right? This immediately tells you that Betelgeuse must be a truly brilliant star. All right? Let's have a look at some of the other stars there. All right? Well, Bellatrix, the, the lower blue one, that's about the same distance, roughly a bit 50 light years further away. All right? It's Bellatrix. So we've got those two. So in fact, Betelgeuse, of all those big bright stars, is actually the closest one to us. As we go outwards, look at them, we're going further and further backwards in time. Then we've got Saf at the top, right? 722 light years away. And I want you to remember this, is when we're talking about light years, we're also talking about time. So when you look at Saf in the sky there, you're seeing Saf as it was 722 years ago. Like if it exploded today in real time, it will be another 722 years before we'd actually see that event take place. So there's Seth. Then moving on to the mighty big blue white star there, that's Rigel. All right. And it's 773 light years away. All right. So they can see that these, these stars are at enormous distances. But as we move outwards, if we look at the belt stars on the bottom of the pot, We've got El Nitak, which is 817 light years, El Nilan, which is 901, and Mintaka, which is 916 light years away. So again, we're looking at these stars almost where they were a thousand years ago. Finally, looking on the sword, and the sword has got some faint stars, but you can see a patch of light there. You can, it's quite noticeable with the unaided eye, all right? And that's got a distance, that's the, actually the Orion Nebula, which we're going to look in, de de in detail. And that's 1,344 light years away. And the reason why I can tell you exactly how far, these are most recent measurements done with space telescopes where they can precisely work out how far these things are away from us. Okay, chip in if you want to at any time. <laughs> okay, so we go back to Betelgeuse, 427 light years away tells you that this thing is actually absolutely super, okay? Now, here, here's our sun, right? For those of you watching on TV. Right, now let's imagine that we move out from the sun to Pluto, which is the most distant planet in the solar system. Right? And that's what the sun would look like from Pluto, a frozen world out there. And the sun will appear nothing more as a big bright star in the sky, you wouldn't be able to see any of the other the Earth or anything like that. You might you'd spot possibly Jupiter, Saturn, as little moon wandering stars uh, all going around it. But that's what the Sun would look like from Pluto. Now let's imagine another planet at exactly the same distance from as Pluto is from our Sun, orbiting Betelgeuse. Right? Let's have a look at that. That's what it would look like. Okay. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. It's cooler than the sun, so its surface area liberates less energy, but is of titanic sizes. In fact, if we had Betelgeuse as a sun, the Earth would be well inside it. Right? And even uh, poor old Pluto out there, if it was the world out there, it would melt. If Pluto's made of ice completely, it would simply evaporate right, from uh, this gigantic star that it's orbiting. 
I had to give you some information on it. Uh, it's actually Betelgeuse, the total energy coming from it is 10,500 times that of the sun. Right? And it's got a night diameter of just under a thousand times that of the sun, 936. So this is a, what we call a red supergiant. They're very, very rare. Right? But because of it's so big and bright, it stands out just like that bull did over the, over the light years. These supergiants are on their way to ending their lives, aren't they? Absolutely. The red stars, yeah. Uh, eventually, one day, our sun will turn into a red star. Nowhere near as big and bright as Betelgeuse, but it is a sign that the star is running up, using up its nuclear energy. But, of course, in the case of someone like Betelgeuse, its end of its life is going to be spectacular. It's going to explode. And uh, when that happens, you'll know it. You'll be able to see it here in broad daylight. Anyway, we're... Moving on to Betelgeuse, uh, it's Betelgeuse, moving on to Rigel, and um, we can see Rigel there. And close to Rigel is a what we know is known as the Witch Head Nebula. Now, nebula, you've often heard that word. Nebula is a, a, another fancy word for cloud, right? It, it's gas and dust. In this particular case, behind the great or surrounding the great stars of Orion, it's embedded in a vast cosmic cloud of dust and gas that spreads for thousands of light years and where some of this ga gas is in concentrations and is close to a bright star the light from the star illuminates the cloud and that's what you're looking at here is what we call a reflection nebula i'm sure those of you watching this on tv can see the witch the head of the witch there right? so that's right that's rigel there well if we had rigel for a sun well oh boy it's nowhere near as big as as as, um, as Betelgeuse, but it's damn sight hotter. Total amount of energy coming from Rigel is equal to 66,000 suns. But incidentally, the bigger and brighter a star is, the quicker it evolves. So in a, in, a, in time, and not very far away, uh, in, in stellar terms, that is, Rigel will turn into a big bright star just like Betelgeuse. It will turn into a red supergiant and then eventually end up by exploding. Now, Rigel, incidentally, is not a single star. It is a gigantic star, but orbiting around it are actually four other stars or two other bright stars. You can see that I watch you looking at this on TV up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, these are big stars, bigger and brighter than our sun, but each of those itself is a double close double star so Rigel is actually a system of five suns but all of them much bigger and brighter than our sun okay well when we look with long exposure we begin to see the clouds and dust surrounding the Orion Nebula and some of them will glow red by the fact that they're being ionized and so on so it you can see that looking at this on TV, the extent of the brighter regions, but the entire cloud is there. And it looks like a big shell around Orion. Indeed it is. It has these big bright stars turned on, right? so the gas around them is being pushed away. So there's the Witch Head Nebula, looking at this on a bigger scale. And here's the belt, right? Remember the three, the, the three belt stars all around about 900 light years away. And now we're going to have a closer look at the belt of Orion, again using a large telescope. And here we can see the three blue-white stars, really, very really hot. But you can see that the light and energy from these stars is also illuminating some of the gas and dust around them. And the interesting objects are here, looking at, first of all, we have the Horsehead Nebula. I'll bring that up to you a little bit closer. And you can see why it's called the horse head. Right? It does indeed look like a horse, head of a horse sticking out of the cloud. And what the horse head is, is it's actually a, a big column of dense gas, which is denser than the surrounding. And so as everything else has been evaporated and driven away by the radiation from the hot stars nearby, the, um, that region has survived a bit longer. You've got to remember when you're looking at this cloud, it's actually light years in height and so on. So it's that's the horse head nebula. So you see these dark ones and you also see these light ones where they're being illuminated or energised by the sun as the sun's around them. 
Then below the, the uh, horse head, you've got the flame nebula. And incidentally, the horse head and the flame can be easily seen in a, a decent sized telescope. The size telescopes that we have out at uh, in the uh, wire wrapper at Stonehenge. All right. So let's have a look at the flame nebula. And there it is there. And once you see something like that, you know something spectacular is happening there. What we're looking at is a region where star birth is taking place. All right. And or new stars are about to be formed. And the energy from the hot ultraviolet radiation that's pouring out from the center energizes the cloud so it, it re-emits it in different wavelengths we're actually looking at a cavern there aren't we a what a cavern uh, oh yeah you're yeah. looking inside a, a yeah. like a, a cave yeah. it's everything it's been blown out because mm. yeah. again when we look at these things we don't tend to get the 3d perspective and this is more noticeable when we have a look at the orion nebula you've got the sword and the belt on the top there right so let's have a closer look at that. There we are. You can you can see the uh, the horse head there, and the and the brighter stars. Right. Okay, so we've got that uh, the horse head there is eight hundred and seventeen light years away, which is an enormous distance. But the sword, the brightest region of the nebula, which you can see with the unaided eye at the top, which is the Great Nebula in Orion, is thirteen hundred and forty four light years away. Right. And it is the closest region to the sun where new stars are being formed right now. So this is the big incubator. So we'll have a go in and have a closer look at that. We'll bring that up. And look, we'll be looking at it in different wavelengths so we can see different things. So there we can see the nebula. We'll have a look at it in closer detail. Now you can begin to see it lovely. And remember what Kay was saying just now. This is, a, this is another crater here, you see, because what's happened is in within the dark cloud, which you can't see, the, the, the fainter stars that you see around you are actually foreground stars. If we go beyond that, we've got this black cloud, and inside that black cloud, as that cloud is collapsing, it's, it's forming new stars. And as the energy of those stars turn on, it gets a blast of energy, sweeps outwards, and eventually bursts out the cloud. And indeed, there's the rim of the cloud there. And but we, as you can see, we're looking at it as an angle. The centre of the cloud is down the, down the bottom there. And matter is being blasted upwards. So when you look at the other clouds around, that's actually material that's been hurled outwards uh, from the crater that we're looking at. So it's a pretty awesome place. This is, a, this is where creation is sta 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 taking place. The creation of new stars and new worlds and so on. Because it's so bright, there must be quite a few stars being born at the same time. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Stars are never born singularly. They're always born, born in vast groups. So let's, let's go and have a, a closer look at what we can see here, OK? So and again, we're using the Hubble Space Telescope here. We're going to go in right into that central region and have a look. All right. And looking into the bottom of the cavern, there's four stars, and these are called the trapezium. And indeed, in one of our telescopes out at uh, Stonehenge, you can see the trapezium, right? They look like little stars, yeah. Okay, they're bigger and brighter than any star we looked at. Now, we're talking about stars which are hundreds of thousands of times brighter than the sun. The reason they don't look very brilliant in the sky is that is essentially because... Um, then most of their energy is in the form of ultraviolet radiation. And it's that radiation which is illuminating the cloud. Right? When it hits the cloud, it gets absorbed and re-emitted in visible wavelengths. So we only, we only see them as, as uh, 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 nowhere near as, about as bright as they are. And when we go in closer, we find again we've got these enormously powerful blue hot stars. And the age of them, we know now, is 3 million years. Now that might sound pretty old to you, but as far as the universe is concerned, these are babies, all right? Well, how old is the sun? Four and a half billion, 4,600 million years old, yeah. And our sun is not an old star, it's a sort of middle-aged, as it were, right? A bit like me, you know? But these are really, really hot ones, aren't they? Oh, yeah. And they're, going to, they're big, Yeah. so they won't actually live as long as our sun. Oh, no. They, they, they'll mm. probably burn themselves out in a million, million two million years' time. And they will explode again. Right? Now, when I say three million years, that's really the 
isn't it, Kay? The history of the biological history of our species. So these stars were actually born, right? When life was being created. When, no, not when life was being created, no? but when the human species... Well, human, human. First appeared, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, humanoids, I so suppose. So if you go right? back to the dinosaurs, you couldn't see yeah. the Orion Nebula. It didn't exist then, all right? So these things are pretty young, okay? <laughs> Okay, but the, th the interesting thing is, as the energy blasts away from that tra those trapezium stars, right, it uncovers other objects in the cloud. And have a closer look at this for the on TV. And these are illuminated. They're, they're actually not shining on themselves. And what these are are smaller stars. Stars similar to our, in mass to our sun, which are still in the process of forming. And close identification of them shows that as they collapse they spin forming a disc around them right but surely they'd be smaller ones because they're getting the raw material Absolutely. stripped away yeah that's right that's right so w what we've got here we could we see the trapezium the big bright stars but there's, there's several hundred other stars there being formed as well and not only that forming around them we have also got the uh planetary system being formed around them in that disk. So right here we've got new worlds are being produced right now. I can remember when that was just a theory. Yeah. Yes, I know. Yeah. We were working at Carter Observatory when it got proven and those photographs got taken. Well, it's, it's like planets, you know, extraterrestrial planets. We, we knew the planets around our sun and it, most astronomers believed, unless that we were some sort of major freak, Planets should be, from our theories of how they were formed, they should be planets around other stars. Yeah, stars. I can remember Ed Sullivan coming in and jump, literally jumping up and down with excitement because they'd yeah. discovered an exoplanet and yeah. it was it was one of the first. And now, of course, what we know is actually thousands of stars mm. uh, beyond mm. the solar system. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, th thousands of worlds out there and we're discovering more every day. So planets appear to be the natural process. Now, what's actually forming there? is a cluster of stars, all right? And all, all, um, all um, stars are formed in clusters, hundreds of stars. And if you scan along the Milky Way with a pair of binoculars, you begin to pick them up. In big telescopes, they look absolutely fabulous, all right? And these are the forming solar systems, all right? And... Um, in there, and eventually, with time, the, the clusters will disintegrate, and the individual stars will travel around the galaxy. So our sun was once upon a time part of a great cluster in the sky. They found one of our our sun's brothers or sisters, didn't they? Yes, they have. They've yeah. actually identified one of our and tracked its yeah, path away right, from yeah. the right. common origin. Well, well, I was going to take us in to have closer look at. Um, some of the uh, clusters in the sky, but I think we're beginning to run out of time, aren't we? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> but I, I will mention now, as you go down, as you sweep down from the belt of Orion, you go through the Hyades, which is a cluster of stars, and you come to the Pleiades, all right? Which is the most famous star cluster in the sky. It is a cluster of about 400 stars, but... About nine of them stand out altogether. They're also known as the Seven Sisters. How come there's seven when you can actually see nine? Well, <clears throat> there's the Seven Sisters. Uh, I'll pick them out here. You can see seven better than the yeah, nine. <laughs> Alcyone, Merope, Electra, Salino, Maya, and Taigata, and Astarope. But our, the sisters have got to have parents, and the two parents are there. All right? These are Atlas and Pleione. And indeed, Pleione is a very important star for me because it's what got me into visual astronomy. I used to study variable stars, okay? And Pleione was one of the stars I used to observe because it changes in brightness. Sometimes it's as bright as Atlas. And it turns out it's a rapidly rotating star where matter is being... It's spinning so rapidly, it's just about disintegrating. And it's a little bit of sexism there, you know. What's that? What's that? Because Pleione's a female, so... <laughs> I know. She's pretty fearsome. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to watch her. Every yeah. now and then she'll get really ratty. Yeah. Now, uh, Pleione's distance is 392 light years. Right? 
And that, it's essentially all the stars, the Pleiades star cluster is about 400 light years away. And it's 190 times brighter than the sun. I'll have to move through these rapidly because here in New Zealand, we see them the other way around and we call these stars Matariki. Little eyes. Hey, which means little eyes, yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing about it, these stars are important to people around the world. We always talk about Matariki here, marking the beginning of the year, don't we? And it was, they were fundamentally important to the stars. Uh, but well, maybe we should talk about this in greater detail uh, at another. We talk about the Maori perspective of Matariki and the, how important they, the important seasonal role they've played for people around the world. Okay, so there's where it is in the sky. Just come down the belt through there and you come to Matariki. Anyway, folks, just to finish off with, uh, Stonehenge, you want to come out and visit us? We're open from 10 to 4 from Wednesday to Sunday and we've got tours of the night sky at any time by appointment. And thank you for listening to us and uh, hopefully we'll be back in the near future. <laughs>